Chapter 14 Darkness hung heavy across the land. Clouds, thick and dark, had been blown away from the north, casting a pole across the gleaming face of Manslabe. The moon could only be dimly seen behind a cloud cover, a dull glow behind dark nebulous shapes, flaring brilliantly during the infrequent breaks between the clouds. The same chill wind crawled about the ground, causing leaves to skitter and trees to sway. It was a night made for horrors, when even the most skeptical city dweller might ponder the darker mysteries of the world and pause before each shadow, jump at every unseen sound. Through the darkness, two shapes crept from shadow to shadow, pushing a third before them. Wet, wailing sounds could be dimly heard shuddering from the leading figure, her white dress standing out brilliantly against the landscape when she chanced to linger between shadows. Her body was young and shapely, a thing of delicate curves and slender smooth-skinned limbs. She was shivering beneath the thin covering of white homespun, damp with the sweat of fear. The woman's steps were awkward and ungainly, despite the gracefulness of her form, and it was with groans of pain that she stumbled and fell, her choking sobs muffled by the filthy linen sack that had been thrown about her head. Her name was Deithild, one of the five daughters of Reymar Stoss, one of the numerous shepherds of Klausberg. In her twenty years of life, she never experienced much that had been remarkable or exciting and her ambition didn't extend beyond the prospect of a dreary marriage to seal some business dealing of her father's. The terror stalking the district had been the first discordant note in her life, breaking up the harmony and pattern of her days. Now, instead of taking turns to tend the flock, her father took the entire household with him, determined that the horror stalking the land wouldn't glut itself upon his valuable animals. This night, however, Dayfield had begged away from helping her sisters, claiming illness with such conviction that even her suspicious father didn't press the issue. However, instead of the long hours of restful slumber, the young woman found herself awakened in the middle of the night. The terror that had been prowling Klausberg had reached out to claim her, snatching her not from the chill of her father's pastures, but from the supposed safety of her own bed. Pick up the pace, you bitch! snarled one of the brutish men following her, his leathery hand jerking sharply on the rope that bound Dayfield's hands behind her back. The woman wailed into her cruel hood, as she was forced back to her feet by the painful pressure working on her arms. The two men wore rough leather breeches, tunics of wool and crude boots of hide and fur. Swords hung from their hips, and one of the men fingered the stock of a pistol holstered across his belly. Their faces reflected the simplicity of the minds behind them. They were men who took a sadistic delight in the labors which they were sometimes called upon to perform, the kind of unscrupulous men that could be found in the service of any noble family, much like an ill-tempered guard dog, creatures tolerated purely for their usefulness. These men had made themselves very useful over the past few weeks. Certainly their nocturnal labors had been very different from their usual duties, the beating of peasants who refused to pay their taxes, torching the wagons of merchants that fought to escape paying Lord Klausner for the privilege of passing through his lands. Still, the escalation of their brutality didn't disturb them too much. Certainly these nocturnal sojourns for Ivar Cole paid much better than any job they had done before for him. For men without conscience, that was enough. Dayfield was leaning against a tree trying to gather breath between her terrified sobs. The brute holding the rope jerked her around, spilling the girl to the ground. His companion gave a short bark of laughter. Now oh, you've gone and got her all dirty, he laughed. Pick the wench up. Cole will skin us if we're late, the other snarled. His companion stepped forward, hairy hands grabbing a hold of Dayfield's arms. He paused in lifting her, moving one hand to slide down the length of her leg. The captive tried to wiggle out of his clutch, but her strength was not equal to the task. Shame to waste a fine cut of meat like this on coal, the brute holding the girl commented. He laid his neck on the woman's shoulder, blowing his hot breath through the sacking. What say you? 
If you're nice to us, maybe we'll let you go. Enough of that, snapped the man holding the rope. We don't have time to bounce the wench. Cole's expecting us. The other kidnapper licked the bare shoulder of their captive before withdrawing. It seems like a waste, that's all, the thug said. He looked back at the bound woman, raising his voice so that she could hear every word. I mean, taking her out there, to him, to be cut up like something at a butcher's shop. Dayfield fell to her knees again, shuddering and sobbing, wailing with horror. The man holding the rope gave it a savage tug, pulling her back up. She faints and you're carrying her, growled the brute holding the rope. His companion laughed again. Ivar Cole stood beneath the shadows cast by the broken stone wall. It was a curious thing, the steward thought. The blocks didn't seem to have been mortared, but rather fit into each other with such precision that nothing more was needed to hold them in place. More likely some old elven trick, the steward shrugged. There were many mysteries surrounding the elder race. He doubted if men would ever uncover them all. The steward cast a nervous eye overhead, licking his lips nervously as he saw the darkening clouds. This was a problem he did not need. The emergence of more sleep had to be timed correctly, for the ritual to have its full effect. Cole didn't want to trust to any diminishment of the power of the ancient rite. For a moment, he almost wished he knew some sorcerer's tricks that would banish storms. The steward smiled at the thought, chiding himself for such weakness. That way lies heresy, he told himself. Cole cast a sour glance at the man standing beside him, then looked away when he heard the faint sound of someone making their way through the woods. He retreated a bit deeper into the shadow, but as he listened further, he could hear the now familiar sounds and wails of a sacrifice, as the doomed soul was led to the place of ritual by his thugs. A fanatic gleam glared up in the steward's eye. He looked again at the figure standing beside him, nodding his head. The man helped Cole into his black robe, then handed the steward a golden dagger. Pray to Sigmar that this is the last one, Cole said, striding out into the clearing to greet the approaching figures. He could see his men leading their charge forward. A sickly smile crept onto Cole's features. Sigmar forgive him, but a part of him hoped it wouldn't be. Stay with the horses, Fulman said, his voice sharp and cold. Gregor Klausner glared back at the witch hunter. I tell you again, I had nothing to do with those men at the inn, he said for what felt like the hundredth time. As before, the declaration did not impress the Templar. We will soon find out then, won't we? There was no mistaking the tone of menace in Fulman's voice. They stood with the trees bordering the Klausner estate gazing down upon the clearing where the witch-hunter had predicted that the next ritual would be taking place. The witch-hunter had brought them there directly after the events at the Grey Crone, secreting them among the trees. All three men had shared watch duty, waiting until the insidious quarry showed itself. Gregor had begged the witch-hunter to spring as soon as they had seen the two men lurking at the edge of the clearing, but Fulman had called for them to maintain their vigil awaiting the arrival of the other conspirators and their victim. Strang, the witch-hunter hissed. The bearded mercenary looked up at him from where he crouched close to the ground. Master Klausner is remaining here. Kindly relieve him of his weapons. The witch-hunter smiled thinly at the young noble. Purely so you might not be tempted into any injudicious action, he explained. Gregor scowled as he lifted his arms and allowed strength to remove his sword belt and pistol. Nothing personal, you understand, strength told him. The mercenary cast an appraising eye over the sword he held. Of course, he considered, a greedy glint in his eyes. If you're a heretic, I'm gonna get to keep these. He grinned back at Gregor. Nothing personal, of course. An end to your chatter, man, snapped Fulman, drawing both his pistols. We've got work to do. Gregor Klausner watched the two men slip into the darkness, slinking towards the clearing where they could now see three figures approaching. 
Gregor knew they had to be the other heretics and their captive. A cold determination swelled up inside him. He stepped away from the horses, removing the tiny pocket pistol Strength didn't know about. It was an old thing, a relic captured by some long-dead Klausner during a crusade in Araby. Since that time, it had served the Klausners well. It would do so again tonight. Of that, Gregor was certain. Sweat beaded Cole's brow as he stepped towards the approaching man. This would be the one. He could feel it. This would be the one that would put an end to the horror. It had to be. It had to work this time. Cole fingered the hilt of the dagger nervously as they advanced. A sharp crack and boom intruded upon the silence. Cole crumpled to the ground as his knee exploded, bursting apart as though an ogre had smashed it with a hammer. The ceremonial dagger flew out of his grasp, skittering off into the dark. Cole winced in agony, rolling onto his back, fighting to keep from blacking out from the pain surging in him. He could see a man now emerging from the trees, black cloak billowing about him, his face hidden in the shadow cast by the brim of his hat. Smoke rose from the pistol gripped in his left hand. He pointed with the other into the gloom. Ivar Cole felt disgust and rage swell over the pain. The witch hunter. He should have known. Draw your steel, you sons of blaspheming slatterns, Thulman roared, his voice burning with outrage and challenge. The pistol in his hand roared in turn, spitting flame and smoke. The ruffian holding the rope that bound the captive woman gave a cry of agony. He released his grip, falling to the ground and rolling in agony as he clutched the weeping crimson mask that had moments ago been his face. The woman dropped to her knees, screaming in terror into the sack which covered her face. The other brute turned to run. Are you going somewhere, friend? Strang hissed, emerging from the trees opposite Fulman and plunging Gregor's sword into the fleeing villain's stomach. The man gaped, hands flying to his injury, trying to staunch the stream of blood and bile. Strang smashed him aside with the engraved hilt of the sword, knocking him to the ground. The mercenary lifted a pistol gripped in his other hand, sighting across the clearing at a dark-garbed man who emerged from the trees. The pistol cracked and roared, the impact of the bullet spinning the man as he ran towards Fulman, a cavalry saber clenched in his fist. Cole's assistant cried out as he fell. Fulman strode towards Ivar Cole's prone body, holstering the pistols and drawing his sword. A look of indignation, wrath and disgust pulled at the witch hunter's features. He glared down at Cole. If he was surprised to see the steward's face underneath the black robe, Fulman did not let it show. He pricked the injured man's throat with the point of the blade. Cole's eyes grew wide with terror. Fulman smiled down at him coldly. Oh no, his silky voice had the quality of a malevolent mirth to it. You don't die so easily, or so quickly. Across the clearing, Strang removed the linen sack from the sobbing Dayfield's head. He paused to admire the cast of her pretty features, then busied himself undoing the knots that bound her hands. He fumbled with the knot for some time, one dirty paw clutching at the woman's chest, ostensibly to support her. The mercenary looked up at her, a lewd smile on his crude features. Sorry about that, he told her, doing nothing to remove his groping fingers. Everything's going to be all right. Isn't nobody going to hurt you while I have something to say about it? As he freed her hands, Strang braced himself for a slap to his jaw. Instead, such was the woman's relief at her rescue that she wrapped herself around Strang's neck, crushing him in a fierce hug. Her face was buried in his grimy tunic as she sobbed in relief. Strang smiled above her embrace. Very nice to see you feel this way about me, he grinned. Matthias Fulman set his heel on Cole's chest, pinning the injured steward to the ground, then inspected the man's wound. His leg was pumping a steady stream of blood, already a small puddle of it congealing around the man. Fulman swore under his breath, sheaving his sword and pulling a laced handkerchief from his vest. It won't do to have you bleed out on me, Master Cole. Not until you've answered a few questions. I will tell you nothing, Cole snarled through the pain. 
the witch hunter tore the piece of fabric and then wound it around the steward's bleeding stump. He smiled in cruel mockery at the heretic as he pulled the makeshift tourniquet tight. Yes, he chuckled grimly. I do believe I have heard that one before. Fullman! Gregor's voice shouted from the night. Fullman turned his head to see the young man emerging from the trees, a small pistol clutched in his hand. Before the witch hunter could react, the gun gave a sharp bark, and yellow fire, grey smoke, and lead erupted from the barrel. The echo of the discharge was almost immediately drowned out by a burbling wail of anguish. The witch hunter turned his head in the direction of the sound. The man that Strang had shot earlier was lying in a spreading pool of gore, a dark depression in the middle of his forehead. The man's dead hand was closed around a dagger. Friend Strang, Fulman called out. The mercenary was looking over at his employer, having extracted himself from the thankful embrace of the young woman as soon as he heard the pistol shot. Your poor marksmanship will cost you five gold crowns, the witch hunter declared. The mercenary shrugged his shoulders and then turned his attention back to Dayfield's gratitude. Fulman looked over at Gregor. Thankfully, your own was much better, he said, smiling. The young noble nodded his head in acknowledgement of both the unspoken compliment and the unspoken apology. Gregor Klausner stared in horror and loathing at the prostrate form of his father's steward. Anger, the righteous indignation of a man who had sworn to put an end to the horrible crimes committed against the good folk of Klausberg, boiled inside him. But the emotion was subdued by the sick horror that drained the color from Gregor's skin that gnawed at the pit of his stomach and his soul. Ivar Kohl, a man who had known his entire life, a man who had in many ways acted as his father's surrogate when Wilhelm Klausner had gone away to serve the Temple of Sigmar. A stern and unpleasant individual, one that Gregor had feared more than respected as a boy, who he had tolerated more than liked as a man. But to see Cole unmasked before him as the perpetrator of such heinous acts of heresy and wickedness was a thing beyond belief. Yet the evidence, the unquestionable evidence of his own eyes, was laid out before him. The young noble thought once more of the hidden ring in his pocket, that talisman of the Klausner line. The sickness swelled as he desperately tried to tell himself that his fears were impossible. How could his father be a party to such crime? Yet, why else would his oldest and most trusted servant be lying upon the ground, the witch hunter's bullet in his leg? How else could a cluster ring have come to be lying upon the floor of the Brustold's farm? What are you going to do with him? Gregor pointed at the figure of Ivar Cole. The subdued steward glared back at him. Thulman pulled the wounded man to his feet, ignoring the cries of pain the steward uttered as his weight pressed against the wound. As a duly appointed representative of Sigmar's holy order of witch hunters, it is within my authority to question my prisoners in any provincial or municipal structure I deem suits my needs, the witch hunter told him. I am sure that Herr Cole will not object greatly if we escort him home. The witch hunter looked away, shouting over to Strang. What about those two? They're done for, Strang replied casting a sideways look at each of the wounded men squirming upon the ground. The one you shot won't last another five minutes. The one I stuck is spilling his belly. Might take a few more hours to finish bleeding out. The mercenary spat at the arriving man. A load better than the vermin raids, he snarled, much to the approval of the woman who still held him in a fierce embrace. Well, see they are both finished and then hurry it up. The witch hunter snarled. We're going to take Master Cole here back to the keep. There will be work for you to do when we get there. The face of Strang split into a bloodthirsty grin. Chapter 15 The witch hunter's boots clicked across the floor of the keep's entry hall. He cast an imperious gaze across the dimly lit room and then focused his attention back on the frightened servant who had let them in. The man kept looking over at the sagging, bleeding figure of Ivar Cole, with an expression that was a mix of shock, wonder, and even a little satisfaction. 
the steward was not well loved by the staff. Gregor, the witch hunter spoke, escort Strang and my prisoner down to the cellar you spoke about. During their ride back to the keep, Gregor Klausner had related that his great-grandfather, a morbid and intensely zealous man, who had expired in the act of scourging himself with a steel whip in his later years, had maintained a gruesome reminder of his years as a witch hunter. Beneath the wine cellars, in a sub-level, he built a torture chamber, equipping it with all kinds of implements of the trade. It was an ugly little room, and though it had never been used, it still seemed to echo with the sounds of screaming. Fulman smiled grimly, commenting that Sigmar provides. The two men carried their injured captive away. Strang sneered into the semi-conscious heretic's ear. Many is the time you went past that room, I wager. The mercenary laughed. Didn't ever think you'd be visiting it yourself, though. Pushing their near-insensible prisoner, the two men disappeared down one of the corridors opening into the great hall. The shocked servant watched the men leave. You, Fulman's voice snapped, causing the servant to spin around. Take this girl to the kitchens, get her some food, some decent clothes, and a bit of good wine to burn the chill from her bones. The witch hunter gestured and the servant took the hand of the pale, trembling girl who lingered about the threshold. Dayfield pulled away in fright. It is all right, child, Thulman's soothing tones told her. This man will take you somewhere warm and get you something to eat. He fixed the man with a warning look. No harm will come to you. Dayfield reluctantly allowed herself to be led away, pausing before Fulman to return his cloak, which the Templar had thrown about her when they had left the site of Cole's abortive ceremony. The witch hunter smiled in return, watching the rescued woman be taken away. As soon as she was out of sight, the smile dropped into something unfriendly and filled with anger. Fulman lifted his gaze towards the stairs. It was time for a reckoning. Matthias Fulman glared across the bedchamber, his wrath fixed upon the withered man nestled within the mammoth bed. The witch hunter's face twitched in a barely controlled fury. He pointed a gloved finger at the chambermaid who was fluffing pillows in a corner of the room. Leave us, he snarled. The tone in his voice caused the girl to set down her work and hurry out of the room, with only a single worried glance to her bedridden master. Now, the witch hunter added, in a hiss when she didn't move fast enough. Fulman's anger was matched by that of the aged Wilhelm Klausner. How dare you, the old man growled. I'll not put up with this nonsense any longer. He reached his hand for the bell rope beside him, tugging at it furiously. Distantly, the jangle of the bell could be heard sounding somewhere within the keep below. You will find your steward is otherwise occupied, Fulman informed the patriarch. He is with my man, down in your torture chamber, your lordship. The scorn in his voice was like the edge of a knife. Wilhelm Klausner flinched away, his already pallid skin losing more of its color. Oh, yes, your lordship, Fulman pressed noting the man's anxiety. The fiend which was preying upon your district has been unmasked at last. The witch under sand closed about the hilt of his sword, the knuckles whitening beneath his glove. By Sigmar, you are more of a monster than any of the vermin you sent to the stake, he spat. The violence in his words caused Wilhelm to regain much of his composure, the old man rising up to the Templar's challenge. Who do you think you are to speak to me in such a fashion in my own home? Fulman began to pace, his hand opening and closing about the hilt of his sword. He stalked past the small writing table situated near the corner of the room, its surface pitted by age beneath its sheen, a well-worn book of Sigmar dominating its surface. Above the table, fixed to the wall, was a wooden plaque, upon which was fixed the seal of Sigmar, the sigil of the twin-tailed comet that was given to every witch-hunter. Fulman scowled as he considered that it had once been worn by the patriarch. It was a struggle for the witch-hunter not to rip it off its fixture. 
I have not dragged the story in full from coal yet, he snarled, turning away from the offending plaque. But be certain that I shall. My man is a hedonist, a thug and a drunkard, but when it comes to the art of torture, he is a prodigy. What little I did gleam from the semi-coherent ramblings already turns my stomach. Preying upon your own people, offering them up in pagan sacrifice in return for some sorcerous protection. You dare! shouted Wilhelm, his entire body trembling from the emotion swelling up within him. I deny these filthy allegations. How dare you accuse me, I who served the temple and the empire with devout loyalty my whole life? The old man's withered claw rose, swiping at the air. Get out of my house, he roared. You have no authority here, your lordship, spat Fulman, stalking forward like some great beast. This farce is at an end, he added with a snarl. All you deny is the glory and might of Holy Sigmar. The door began to open behind him, a liveried servant moving to enter in answer to Wilhelm's summons. The witch-hunter grabbed the handle, slamming the portal shut in the man's face. You, a servant of Sigmar, the witch-hunter sneered, voice dripping with venomous contempt. Be thankful that I was in time to stop your steward from completing the obscenity he contemplated this night. It'll be one less crime to answer for when you stand before Sigmar and are judge for your blasphemies. The Templar stalked past the foot of the bed once more, passing before the old man's massive wardrobe and the glass face cupboard which held musty relics from Wilhelm's time of service to the temple. Wilhelm Klausner seemed to wilt as he heard Fullman's words. He lifted a trembling hand to his mouth. You... you stopped? A look of absolute terror came upon him, and he gave voice to a rattling sob that seemed to surge from the very pit of his soul. Now we are doomed, the old man groaned. You were doomed and damned when you chose to forsake the might of Sigmar and put your faith in profane sorcery to preserve you from evil. The witch-hunter rebuked him. The door behind him opened once more. This time it was not a servant, but a livid Anton Klausner who stood outside. The young Klausner stepped into the room, his face contorted with his own indignant fury. "'What the devil are you?' The young noble's words were cut off as he spoke. Fulman's gloved hand shot from the hilt of his blade, striking Anton across the face with the back of his hand, with such force that the young man was thrown to the floor. Fulman glared down into Anton's face as the boy reached for his own weapon. "'Draw that blade but an inch,' the witch-hunter growled, "'and I shall paint that wall with your blood, be you guilty of your father's heresies or not.' The cold, chill manner in which Fulman spoke his threat caused Anton to back down, the young Klausner daubing at the thin trickle of blood dripping from the corner of his mouth. The boy turned his gaze from the glowering witch-hunter to the withered old man on his sickbed. Anton stared in bewilderment at the expression on his father's face. Written upon that aged visage was misery and defeat and shame. Emotions Anton had never before seen exhibited by his always stern and stalwart father. More, there was the agonized appeal in old Wilhelm's eyes, the desperate cry for pity and understanding and forgiveness. Anton felt contempt boil within his heart. After all these years, long years of trying to prove his worth to the old man, and now it was that his father who showed himself to be of no value. Wilhelm Klausner had given everything to his eldest son. To Anton, he had given only his name. And Anton had taken great pride in that name and in the long history of honor and tradition behind it. The name of Klausner was what made him feel important, made him feel better than the swineherds and farmers. He could clearly see the guilt in his father's face, more evident even than the old man's shame and fear. Wilhelm Klausner had given Anton his name, and now he was taking even that away from him, staining it with such crimes that he had drawn the attentions of an outlander witch-hunter. 
The youth bared his teeth in a feral snarl, picking himself from the floor and storming from the room, slamming the door behind him. Thulman again fixed Wilhelm with a harsh gaze. I do not know how deep this heresy runs, he spat, but I will find out. I will learn the root of this madness, which has infected both you and your household, and I will burn it from the face of the empire. Anton Klausner smashed his fist against the hard stone wall, giving voice to an inarticulate howl of animal rage. How dare that old man! How dare he! Anton would have not believed anything the witch hunter said, anything that anyone said. But he had seen the truth in his father's own eyes the dismal guilt and self-loathing, the resignation to a long-deferred doom. The youth howled again. He would not cry. He would not shed one tear for that old bastard. Anton looked below to see Gregor racing up the steps, taking them two at a time. The other cluster son had finished conducting Streng and the prisoner to the old dungeon and was now desperate to reach his father, to hear for himself Wilhelm's reaction to the witch-hunter's accusations. Despite the firm conviction that gripped Fulman and Gregor's own disturbing discovery of the family ring at a Brustholz farm, the young noble couldn't bring himself to believe his father guilty of participating in such unholy conspiracy. What has happened? Gregor called out to Anton as he approached his brother, seeing the violent distress on Anton's face, the blood trickling from the bruised mouth and savage hand. Anton's gaze was as cold as the winds of Kislev. Ruin, Anton answered. Ruin has come upon us. Your witch hunter friend has destroyed us. Anton's face twisted about in a grim sneer. Oh, maybe you, he laughed without mirth. You'll get the title and the lands and the power, but all I had was the name the name of Klausner, and the legacy of honor and valor that accompanied it. He clenched his bruised fist. It's being stripped away. The witch hunter won't leave that. When he is finished, there will be no honor left. He is with father? Gregor asked. The murderous hatred in Anton's eyes caused him to recoil. That sick old heretic bastard up there is no father of mine, he spat storming past Gregor, shouting for his ruffian cronies. Gregor watched his brother, shaking his head, and then continued on to his father's room. Gregor found the witch-hunter pacing across his father's room, his body trembling with every step, his hand clenching and unclenching about the hilt of his sword. The old man on the bed seemed even more shrunken and withered than ever before, looking like a pile of old, tired bones. Something had been taken from his father, some vital spark, and its absence had diminished the old man hideously. Thulman turned on Gregor as the young noble entered. The Templar's face retained its mask of grim judgment, and for a moment, Gregor actually thought that he was going to draw his sword. This does not concern you, Gregor, the witch hunter told him. If there is one man in this entire district that is innocent of this heresy, it is you. Fulman closed his eyes, a tiny fraction of his rage escaping him in a sigh. Your marksmanship this evening proved that. When he opened his eyes, the intensity flared up again. Leave this room. The young noble stood his ground. He is my father, Gregor said. The words caused Wilhelm's face to twist in pain and an agonized groan to hiss from his wasted body. He is a heretic and a murderer, Fulman snarled. He knew about the steward's blasphemous rituals. At best, he turned a blind eye to them. At worst, he condoned these profane rites. Or orchestrated them, Gregor thought, his eyes turning towards the Klausner coat of arms fixed above the hearth, and considering the ring that bore the heraldry still secreted in his pocket. He looked again at his father. The old man lowered his eyes, as though too ashamed to face his son. Gregor shook his head. Whatever he has done, he repeated, he is my father. Whatever he has done, echoed Fulman. He sneered at the patriarch. And what have you done? To what depths of obscenity have you sunk? How many people have you seduced into this loathsome sorcery? 
He shook his fist at the man. I will have my answers, he warned. By the temple, I'll have my answers, even if I have to rip them out of you with whip and knife. Gregor clutched at the witch hunter's arm. You wouldn't dare. He gaped in horror. Hulman's expression grew grave. He could sympathize with the young noble's emotion. The affection and love he had always known for his father were not so easy to banish. Still, for the sake of all those who had been ruthlessly slaughtered, he would not be dissuaded from that which needed to be done. I will have my answers, he repeated coldly. Leave now. The witch hunter stabbed a finger at the door. No, he snarled. Gregor strode instead to the small side door that led to his father's private chapel. You are wrong, he said, his voice heavy with doubt even as he said the words. My father couldn't. He has, Fulman spat, glaring once more at the wretched creature on the bed. Look at the guilt gnawing at him, the shame of his unmasking. Wilhelm Klausner, witch hunter. Fulman snorted in contempt. Wilhelm Klausner, necromancer and sorcerer is closer to the truth. He looked at Gregor, studying the younger man's face. You know I am right. Gregor swallowed the lump that swelled in his throat. I will pray for you. Pray that Sigmar will rid you of these hideous delusions that beset you. Pray instead for your father's black soul, that Sigmar might show it some of the mercy this animal never showed his victims. The witch hunter retorted. Do not harm him, Gregor warned. I will be able to hear all that occurs in this room. Wilhelm clenched his teeth in agony as he heard his son's words. The witch hunter merely nodded. I will not do him injury, Fulman said in a chill hiss. Not until he ceases to answer my questions. When that time comes, you can help me destroy this legacy of evil, or you can become a victim of it. That choice I leave to you. Gregor said nothing more, but left the room, slamming the chapel door behind him. Don't harm him, Wilhelm implored in a dry rasp. Fulman stared down his nose at the wasted old man. My sons are innocent of the evil I have been guilty of. I would not let it touch them. The witch hunter smiled back, an expression as cruel and malevolent as any that had ever been cast in stone upon the great temple's gargoyles. Then convince me, Fulman commanded. 